<sighs> Here we go. What's going on? I'm John from Jumpers Junction and in today's video, I want to talk about the difference between speed jumpers and power jumpers in track and field. Now, if you've never heard these terms, I'm referring to athletes who have a tendency to use their speed to influence the way they jump versus athletes who might not be quite as fast, but can still have really good jumps because they're using their muscles and their power to influence the way they're jump. So let me give you an example. Imagine we're at practice and it's a long jump event and we have two athletes. So both athletes go from a short approach at six steps. Now the first athlete runs and jumps 20 feet. The second athlete runs, jumps, and jumps 24 feet. So the second athlete jumped a lot further off this short run up. Now they go to competition and they both go from a full approach at 12 steps. So they're running further and ideally running a lot faster. Now the first athlete who only jumps 20 feet now jumps 25 feet. So speed was very important for that athlete versus the second athlete now on this longer distance runs, jumps, and now jumps 25 feet also. They didn't jump much further on their longer approach than they did on the shorter approach. So it seems that speed wasn't as important for that athlete. So why might the addition of speed be beneficial for one athlete, but not as beneficial for the second athlete? Well, it kind of comes down to our body types. And in the 1940s, a psychologist named William Sheldon introduced the concept of somatotypes. And it's kind of a way to say how lean a person is and what is their ability to store fat and gain muscle. Now he broke it down into three different kind of categories, ectomorphs, endomorphs, and mesomorphs. So ectomorphs are very lean and have a hard time gaining muscle and storing fat. Endomorphs are kind of the opposite. Endomorphs have an easy time gaining muscle, easy time storing fat, and typically easier time gaining weight. Then you have mesomorphs. They're kind of right in that in-between area. They are athletic and tend to have a lot more muscle than say an ectomorph, but not quite to the spectrum of an endomorph. Now jumpers in track and field tend to be either ectomorphs or mesomorphs. An example of an ectomorph would be someone like Jamaican long jumper Tajay Gale. And an example of a mesomorph would be like Swiss decathlete Simon E. Hammer. Now both athletes are great at the long jump with Tajay Gale jumping 8.69 meters and Simon E. Hammer jumping 8.45 meters. But when we look at their 100 meter time, Tajay Gale has ran a 100 meter dash in 10.13 seconds versus Simon E. Hammer has run 10.45 seconds. So it's clear that Tajay Gale has a higher threshold of speed that he can use in his long jump. Basically, as they grow, if you have more muscle, naturally you're gonna have a tendency to then favor those muscles versus someone who doesn't quite have as much muscle. They might learn to develop the way they exert force on the ground a little bit different. And we're gonna talk about the way people might favor their muscles versus favor their tendons and the way they either activate or react. Now in track and field, in the jumps, we jump off of one foot from our takeoff. So when we think about how we interact with the ground, it really comes down to how fast we're moving, how much time we're spending on the ground, and how much bend is there or loading at takeoff. So we jump off of one leg, and what's really important is the way our muscles and the way our tendons act and react at ground contact. So we can send a signal from our brain down to our muscles for it to voluntarily contract. But for our tendons, they're kind of like a rubber band and they're constantly being pulled apart at all time. And they're connecting two endpoints. So we can't ever tell our tendons to either expand or contract, but we can tell our muscles to contract and they'll either shorten or lengthen, which will then either lengthen or short our tendons. Now, if we take our tendons again to think of them like a rubber band or a resistance band that you might use at the gym, think about that resistance band being constantly pulled apart. You pull it back, what you're doing is you're building up stored elastic energy in that band because if you've ever let go of it, it'll snap back because it wants to snap back to its original position. Now, when you pull that band back, the amount of force it takes to pull it back will be equal to the amount of force that that band is going to exert as it shoots back to its original position. So think about a 10 pound resistance band and a 50 pound resistance band. If you pull that 10 pound resistance band, you have to pull it a lot further to get that same amount of resistance that you would from a 50 pound band from only pulling in a short amount, right? So the amount of stored elastic energy is gonna be equal 
to the amount of force it takes to pull it back and how far you have to deform it. Now, there's this thing called energy and work, right? So if I pull the band back, you're storing the energy, and then as you release it, the band is now doing work as it returns back to its original state. So now in humans, that stretch and storage of elastic energy is gonna be in our muscles and our tendons. But when we think about a tendon being more like a rubber band, then most of our energy is actually gonna be stored in the tendons for them to be reactive, which will be very important in just a second because we're gonna talk about this stretch shortening cycle. So why is it so important how our tendons interact with our muscles and where they store energy? Well, we have what's called the stretch shortening cycle and it's, it's the cycle in which our muscles contract at ground contact. So think about you running down your approach and you hit the takeoff board or the takeoff position and you plant your foot. Well, you're not gonna just jump from a straight leg. There's gonna be some bend at your knee and at your hips as you lower down before you extend that knee straight to jump. We have three different phases of the stretch shortening cycle. We have the eccentric phase, which is that lowering down. I'm actually lengthening my muscles of my hips, my glutes, and my quads as I bend my knees and bend my hips. I'm lowering down, think of a spring being compressed. Then I get to the lowest position that I'm gonna get to and I stop moving. Now my muscles are still contracted, but they're in a static contraction. And this is called the isometric or transition phase. So I'm not moving anymore, but my muscles are still contract. And this is the phase where I'm actually transitioning my isometric force into my tendon. So now I've lengthened my tendons, I've pulled them apart, and I've got all this energy now stored in my tendons, ready to explode. Because what happens next is you get the concentric phase. The concentric phase is where you contract your muscles and you have muscle shortening, which then extends your leg straight. And when you do that, that's the jumping motion. So think about this. If I just do a broad jump, I can jump a certain distance. But if I put a band around me and I tie that band forward in the direction that I'm gonna be jumping, that band is gonna assist me to jump even further. Now, the tendons and muscles act in the same way. So as I go in the concentric phase and I explode out my jump, this is gonna get accelerated because my tendons have all the stored energy. It's kind of like that rubber band now snapping back. It's the rubber band that's assisting me and pulling me forward. Now, there's something called active state. So active state is just the longer it takes me to lower down, the more time I have to build up these forces that I can then transmit into my tendons so that I can have a really strong concentric phase. The longer it takes me to build down, the more time I have to build these forces, which then means there'll be an increase in what's called impulse. Now, impulse is important because remember this, on our jumping events in track and field, we build up our speed and momentum, and then we jump. So at some point we have to change our direction from a horizontal to a vertical component. Impulse is what happens. We accelerate and accelerate is just a change in velocity. Well, impulse is a change in momentum. So we wanna generate an impulse at takeoff. It's the same concept as acceleration, but impulse means you're getting faster while moving something and now there's a direction component to it. So how does this all relate to speed jumper versus a power jumper? So speed jumpers that are a little bit faster have this tendency to use their momentum and speed that they build from their run up to generate that impulse at takeoff. So they're typically in these ectomorph body types where they don't have quite as much muscle because they're not used to generating a force without the use of momentum. So what happens is then they tend to build a greater response from their tendons elastic capabilities, meaning they might have more of that 50 pound resistance band as compared to the 10 pound resistance band. And if you have that, then you don't have to use quite as much muscular action at takeoff, meaning you don't have to bend your knee quite as much because you don't have to lower down quite as far. And because you're moving a lot faster, then you can exert that force a lot faster versus power jumpers might not be quite as fast and therefore they might be more inclined to use their muscles to generate an impulse at takeoff. Meaning they will need to have a greater knee bend at takeoff, they'll need to lower down in their stretch shortening cycle even further, which will take longer to generate those forces which they can then transmit into their 10 pound resistance band of a tendon 
because they both can exert the same amount of force to take off. Just the speed jumper has a greater component of their acceleration coming from their horizontal run up, but the power jumper is less reliant on their horizontal acceleration, but makes up for it by lowering down further to build up the force. And so because power equals work divided by time, we can say that speed jumpers will do less work, but they'll do it faster versus power jumpers will do more work because they do it slower. But they still can produce the same amount of power at takeoff. So how might this look and how do we summarize this? Well, think about this from the perspective of a long jumper. Those who fall in the speed category tend to be fast and therefore they are used to using their horizontal momentum into the jump so they might not have as much knee bend at takeoff because their tendons have then developed to be reactive and they're less reliant on their muscular activation. So they might have lower takeoff angles, they might not have to jump quite as high to get that extra distance versus a power jumper they might be more inclined to use their muscles at takeoff because they're less reliant on that horizontal speed. When they use that muscles, it takes a little bit longer. They're gonna have a greater knee bend. They're gonna lower down to use those muscles in order to build up those forces that they can then use to generate that vertical component of impulse. So they might have a higher takeoff angle and get more height. That's all for today. If you enjoyed this, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And let me know if you wanna see more like this. And I'll see you next time. Thanks.